we're going to talk about um, a very different type of cells that can produce a different metabolite. And the metabolite that of interest here is enzymes. But will enzymes be only produced from microorganism cells? No. Plant cells also produce enzymes. Mammalian cells also produce enzymes. So we won't zoom into the specific enzymes of mammalian cell or plant cells. But we will talk about enzymes in general. So we're talking about enzymes, the use of enzymes in food bioprocessing. I hope that you can still remember what enzymes are. So basically, enzymes uh, aid in a reaction. It reduces the energy for the reaction so that the reaction can be speed up at a lower energy. And enzymes, unless they get denatured, they will go on in a cycle. As long as there are substrates, enzyme will react to it. Okay? So I've covered this mainly in the first year, and I think for food students, you would have covered enzymes um, maybe last time or in your first years as well, right? First year. So I hope you still remember that. So now we're going to talk about enzymes and the use of enzymes in food bioprocessing. Why are enzymes important? So enzymes can be put in a variety of uses. Now in traditional fermentation, we will be looking at the use of enzymes but we are not knowingly aware of it. One good example is budu. Budu is actually fermented fish. Um, those of you who are not familiar with budu, you will be much more familiar maybe with uh, fish sauce. Thailand, if you go to Thailand, one of the uh, side dish that they always serve you with your main dish is fish sauce, right? So fish sauce or budu are actually by our products of fermented fish. So what happens is that fish are allowed to ferment, or in other words, allowed to rot under certain conditions. So during that fermentation process, all the gut microorganisms in the fish itself will be producing all these enzymes. And these enzymes, uh, most of them are proteases. They will degrade proteins from meat, uh, the fish meat. And because of that, the fish get hydrolyzed. Fish meat get hydrolyzed, the muscles, the tissues all get hydrolyzed. And it releases a lot of aromatic compounds. Depending on whether you like budu or not, if you like budu, you definitely love the kind of aromatic compounds. But if you don't, then uh, that's a different story. So that is one good example. Now we are thinking, can we actually utilize this concept for other food bioprocessing? Actually, yes. Many of these uh, food enzy uh, enzymes, not food enzymes, enzymes, may it be from plant cells, animal cells, or microbial cells, can actually be used for food bioprocessing. So one of it is surimi. I don't know why this thing is not appearing. Let me try this again. Okay. Okay, surimi. So surimi, many of us would know surimi. And many of us would have consumed surimi, but many of you may not know what exactly surimi is. Now, when you go to a, um, it may not be a Japanese restaurant, in Malaysia, any restaurants, yes, any restaurants, there are so many restaurants that actually serve surimi, you will have crab stick, right? Then you will have scallop stick, all these kind of sticks. Yeah, fish, fish sticks, of course. Are crab sticks made from crab? No, they're actually from, yes, they are actually from fish. Uh, scallop stick are also from fish. They're actually fish products. What happens is that it's actually a gel, a fish gel. So what happens is this, surimi, well, from the Japanese word, it means mince. So what happens is that the fish flesh is mince. Then after that, it is a gel by enzymes to form a gel-like structure which is why we can have all these uh, round shape, uh, a long stick shape where we call crab sticks, scallops uh, uh, stick and so on. And uh, they are mixed with other types of things such as sugar, sorbitol. Sorbitol is a sugar alcohol, uh, phosphates and then frozen. So as you can see that it is a heat gel product. Now during gelation, okay, now during gelation, the conditions of gelation is very important because you don't want a surimi product or a gel product that is too hard and when you're biting it, you feel like you're biting rubber or it's too soft, you lose its texture. So basically, during the uh, gelation process, 
it is the amino acids that get cross-linked. So when they link, they form gel. And as we can see here, two of the very important um, amino acids is the uh, glutamate and lysine. So what actually cross-link glutamate and lysine? It is this enzyme called transglutaminase. So as you can see, uh, the name transglutaminase, it will actually cross-link glutamate and lysine, forming gel. Now transglutaminase used to be expensive, but now it is relatively very cheap. I remember for my own research project, I wanted to buy uh, two kilos or one kilo. They didn't want to sell me one, two kilos because every time that they sell, it's 25 kilos in a big bag. So when I said I want one kilo, two kilo, uh, the supplier actually gave it to me as a free sample, which is good. Because for enzymes, as I've mentioned, unless they get denatured, as long as there's substrate, it will keep its activity going on. I don't need that much. And at lab scale research, we don't need 25 kilos. But if you're in production, then you may need 25 kilos to produce large amount of these heat, heat form gels. So the activity of fish uh, glutaminase actually is the foundation of this currently synthesized transglutaminase. So inside the uh, fish stomach, the, they are endogenous fish transglutaminase. So which means that inside the fish itself, in its intestines, they will be transglutaminase. So if the fish is alive, uh, the, active is, uh, the enzymes are active. But once the fish dies, the enzymes will start to decay. So for these very high quality uh, surimi products, last time what they do is that they will have to process the fish immediately after catching. But that will be very expensive, which means that the boat or the ship that, sends out, that sails out to sea to catch all these fish will have to be equipped with all these processing uh, uh, equipment and facility to actually process the fish at sea. If they bring the, the uh, fishes or the catch back to shore, the enzymes may have already been decayed. So the uh, processing of this heat, uh, of this gel product uh, are actually not of such large quantities, not of such high quality. So what happened is that right now, with uh, transglutaminase being produced by bioprocessing and some of it being chemically synthesized also, it reduces cost and they can actually bring the enzyme to C and they can actually process it there. They don't have to actually uh, have the whole full facility. So that's what it means by uh, uh, all these commercial impracticality. Now there are also mi microbial extracellular transglutaminase. So one example here is from Streptoviri cilium. Now this bacteria produces transglutaminase. So if we were to ferment this bacteria, optimize its growth condition for it to produce optimum quantities and qualities of transglutaminase, then we could actually harvest the enzyme itself. But of course, once you just harvest from fermentation, you cannot directly use because it is uh, crude. We, for enzymes, we need to go through purification and all that. And I will cover that during downstream processing. Okay? Now I have a video, of, uh, of course, uh, microbial transglutaminases because it cross-links uh, glycine and glutamine. It actually produces a stronger gel quality of surimi products. I have a video here. So as we can see just now, there were fishes, fish uh, flesh all being put into the system, being crushed, being minced, and then you see washing. Because surimi is basically proteinaceous, proteinous product. So they are washing off the lipids, some of the carbohydrates, and that's why you can see that the uh, fish meat has turned a bit white. It's not that they're bleaching it, but a lot of all the compounds are actually being removed.
Now see that, that's actually a thermometer to measure temperature. Because as we add in enzyme, we have to be very careful. If the temperature is higher, the, um, the uh, enzymes and also some of the proteins of the fish itself are going to get denatured. Now after gelation, definitely there will be some, um, it's just like milk curdling, you have whey. So after gelation, this will also have excess uh, liquid, so it's going to be drained off. And these are the gels, as you can see, it's even whiter than before. So there will be further strain to remove moisture. And then it's a, it will be uh, turned into a, a very thick paste. And uh, this is where they compress the gel. So that's the weighing machine. Now, this company, I, I reckon that they will just supply the gel to individual companies. And it's up to that company. What is it that they want to turn it to? Do they want to turn it into a crab steak or a scallop steak or a fish steak or balls? What, whatever, it's up to them. And many instances, those companies will have their own um, favoring, flavoring secrets. Uh, it's just like Pringles. You try to reproduce Pringles. They have all the ingredients there, all the flavoring codes that are allowed. You try to buy those flavoring and try to make your own Pringles. I've tried, it doesn't work. <laughs> so they, they, they have all their confidentiality. So same thing here, all right? Okay, any questions on Surimi? No? Then we're going, or maybe we have questions at the end, all right? Now, then we go next to salmon ikura. Uh, I am a very big fan of Japanese food. So somehow, as you can see from my slides, there are a lot of Japanese foods uh, as, as used as examples. Now, what are ikura? Ikura actually, salmon ikura means salmon eggs. So if ikura from another, another fish, then it's the uh, eggs of the other fish. Now, I'm sure all of you would have gone to Sushi King or Sakai Sushi and you would have ordered all the sushi with eggs on top. Do you notice the size of the eggs? Very tiny. And uh, actually, the ones that are in Japan, most of them are very big, around 4 to 5 mm in diameter. Ours is like, um, what? one to two mm in diameter. So when I was actually telling uh, my Japanese friends, they said, no, no, I don't think those are real. So yeah, maybe those are synthetic, I don't know. And then they taught me the way to differentiate between a synthetic one and a real one. So you took the bead and you rub it on a surface and you feel the bead. If you feel that the surface is uneven, that is real egg. If you feel that the surface is very smooth and it's very even, that's fake ones. So it, that's, uh, uh, that's ikura, but I won't be talking about salmon ikura, all right? Now, we take for advantage, even if you were to buy the synthetic ones, hopefully you're buying the real ones. Oh, by the time you buy, it's already in a packet form. And if you know how to make sushi, you just take it from the packet and put on top of your sushi. But what we don't know is that behind the process of obtaining this ikura is actually a very, very tedious process. I'm going to show you a video later on how tedious it is. So basically, um, well, this is um, the uh, introduction of this. Now, these eggs do not come in individual eggs once you slaughter the fish. It actually comes covered in skines. So there's actually a collagenous membrane. And inside that membrane, that is where you find all these fish eggs. Now, to separate these fish eggs from the skine is a very laborious, it's a very time-consuming process. So conventionally, people will be doing that, peeling it off one by one. Now what happened is that, uh, of course, you have the skine, then after that, you bring the whole skine to the brine solution. After that, uh, it will be processed under a lower temperature because we don't want to denature some of the uh, uh, proteins or enzymes that may actually denature the eggs itself, the ikura itself. So compress under weight, uh, three to five days below, at least, as you can see, 11 degrees C. If you go to YouTube and just look for Ikura processing, those very 
high levels restaurants, the chef will actually be working in cold water all the time just to get this ikura. So they're individual eggs separated from uh, the skies. So conventionally, you'll be separating it using your own hands. And as I've said, it's very laborious. And these are some of the examples that you can see. Now, these are the big ones, 4 to, four to 5 mm. And these are the ones that are sold, already peeled off. But that will be expensive. I have seen very, very expensive ones. Uh, but of course, I've also seen very, very cheap ones in the market, Japanese market. Now, so how are we going to do this? Are we going to still conventionally, manually peeling it off one by one? Or can we think of an alternative to use enzymes from bioprocessing to aid in the peeling of this? Oh, actually, we can. Now, this is the example. Now, this is how it is when it's sold. So, still wrapped up in the sky. So, when we slaughter the fish, you see this whole thing, and this is how they're sold. Now, this will be cheaper. If you buy this, process it on your own, then it will be cheaper. And uh, we won't not need to go through this because there will be a video later and you're going to see that. So what happens is that, uh, I hope you have your notes because this one is already covered by this, it's actually collagenase. So actually the sky is, uh, I think I better show you the video first and then you get an idea what I'm talking about. Now this is the traditional way. So if you were to buy those skines from the market, this is what you will have to do. I hope some of you are taking Japanese classes.
fast, right? The video is only five minutes and you get a lot of eggs already. No, you have spent hours doing that. Okay, so now you get the idea. Where is my slide? Okay, now you get the idea. And it's not that direct, and you cannot basically press so hard on the, on the sieve as well. You're going to break the eggs. So very delicately done, very laboriously done. And um, so there, there will be always ways that we are trying to improve that. So of course we can, because the skine is basically uh, one of the main material is collagen. So if we can break the collagen, then we can help to release the eggs. So one of the uh, good ways of releasing the eggs where the disruption of collagen will be the use of an enzyme called collagenase. Now this idea spuns out from nature. Now in nature, do you think that the female fish will lay the eggs and leave the eggs as a whole bunch like that, a whole group? Very hard for them to be fertilized. So what happened is that the female fish will also have collagenase. And at the same time, the collagenase will act to separate all the linkages between the eggs, the collagen. And so the eggs can be left individually, although still grouped together, but individually, so that they can be fertilized. So that happens in nature. And from that, we get the idea of producing collagenase and using collagenase to actually disrupt collagen from the sky so that the eggs can be re uh, uh, released easily. So collagenase can be used. Now, recovery of a quality good eggs, but of course, that would depend on enzyme treatments and also concentration. Everything when it comes to enzymes have to be optimized. We don't know initially how much concentration of collagenase that needed to be added in. We don't know what's the uh, duration of the enzyme activity. We don't know, well, we know the optimum temperature, but we don't know how long to leave it to react for. So all that have to be optimized. Once optimized, then hopefully we can have a very good quality processing system. Okay. Okay. Then we are going to move on to PUFA and rich fish oil. Now PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acids. All of us want polyunsaturated fatty acid. Everyone knows that the more saturated fat you consume, the higher risk for all these cardiovascular diseases. And because of that, in diet, uh, very frequently, fatty acids intervention are recommended, where we are recommended to take unsaturated fatty acids compared to saturated fatty acids. So many of us who actually consume diets containing unsaturated fatty acid, the PUFAS, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and um, some of us who do not have the time or luxury to actually cons keep consuming these PUFA foods can actually have PUFA supplements. Am I right? You can actually get a lot of these PUFA supplements over the counter from pharmacies or drugstores. Now, they are also called omega-3, and uh, the very famous ones are the DHAs and EPAs. So within the pharmaceutical industry, there's always an increase in demand for DHA and EPAs. But um, do we actually produce that much of DHA and EPAs naturally. In actual fact, we don't. Because when we produce fatty acids, unless it is uh, synthesized, chemically synthesized, if we are getting from that nature sources, there's always a limit, certain percentage that we can extract from. But those pharmaceutical pills, supplements that we get, are very high in concentration of DHA and EPA. So how does that happen? Okay. This is one good example. You can have uh, one of the good sources of DHA EPA is to get from marine sources. And one of the good marine sources will be deep sea fishes, such as um, salmon, uh, all the deep, deep sea fishes. Now, the reason for that is that because when they live in deep sea, how do you think the weather is? The temperature is deep sea. Very hot, right? Very cold. It will be very cold. And if it's so cold, inside the intestines of the, uh, inside the, intestines of the fishes, 
there will be bacteria. And if it's very cold, the bacterial membrane will get frozen. So if it's frozen, less fluid, they will die. Um, of course, there's a longer explanation for that. But just briefly, generally, the microorganism in the gut will die. So to prevent themselves dying, to prevent death, what they do is that they produce a lot of unsaturated fatty acids. So unsaturated fatty acids will not get um, frozen so fast compared to saturated fatty acid. And because of that, they try to maintain membrane fluidity so that it won't get frozen, it won't get hardened, they won't die. So because of that, these deep sea fishes will have this microorganism in the gut capable of doing that. And because of that also, these deep sea fishes will have a higher content of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So I want to show you one example of this bear uh, that catches salmon, eat them, and they are highly nourished with all these uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Now, why is it called a nature's great event? The salmon are not meeting the bears. The bears are waiting for the salmon. Now, the reason why these salmon are going upstream is because they want to lay their eggs. And so, every uh, laying egg season, they will have to swim in the opposite direction of the water tide, which is already a challenge. And with all the bears waiting there, another challenge. So, but what the commentator mentioned is very true. The salmons come in numbers. So for every one bear, uh, one fish that get caught by the bear, there will be hundreds else that make it through to upstream to lay their eggs. So the rest, unfortunately, uh, will be caught by the bears. Okay, so it's one of nature's greatest events. So that's what it means by BBC. Yes. I don't know whether it's migration season or during mating season. You can check on that, okay? All right, so that's uh, the original sources of polyunsaturated fatty acids. So if you, want, you don't want the pills, you don't like the supplement, then consume more of this uh, deep sea fishes. But for now, because of its commercial values, some of these fishes can also be bred. So you will have to look at the label very carefully, whether are they actually caught deep sea or are they actually farmed. So when it comes to natural sources of polyunsaturated fatty acids, from salmon, for example, if we were to extract uh, fats and oils from salmon, do you think that we are going to get very high concentration of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids? No. Yes, we will get, get higher, relatively higher compared to many other fishes. But to match the concentration that we have in the pills or in the capsule, that is almost impossible, uh, naturally extracted. And not just that, in addition, when we extract fats and oil from original sources, we will have a mixture of fatty acids. Not necessarily all of them are going to be unsaturated. So we're going to have a mixture. And from here, we can say maybe a mixture of more than 50 fatty acids. So how are we going to pick up one by one and to make that and concentrate them in capsule forms or in supplement forms. So what happens now is that there are various enzymes and because we are dealing with fats and oils, we are dealing with lipases. Depending on what kind of unsaturated fatty acids that we want, we can actually 
tailor the lipases to be used. So these lipases will actually act on the long chains of fatty acids uh, or long chains of lipids, cut them off into shorter chains of fatty acids. Now once they are cut off into shorter chains of fatty acids, we can actually, um, uh, how to say, merge them back into the glycerol backbone to form polyunsaturated fatty acids. So we are going to look at one example here. Okay, now this is a backbone of glycerol. We can add in three branches of fatty acid and then that would form triacylglycerol. Now this process will be called the esterification process. Once we have all this, then we can have a lot, depending on the chain of this, if it's long and it's unsaturated, then that is what we want, polyunsaturated fatty acids. So which means that initially we need an enzyme to actually cut off the long chain of lipid to form all these, oops, 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 to form all this. To form all these free fatty acids, we want the free fatty acids. Then after that, we will merge it back with glycerol, trans, uh, transesterified to form triacylglycerol. So this part will be collected, and after that, once it's formed, then concentrated, and that's why we could go get concentrated or polyunsaturated fatty acids supplements. Okay. Okay. Now, traditional chemical modification can also be used when we talk about lipases. How do we deal with lipases? But the um, chemical modification last time before enzymes come into the picture may be a little bit harsher and the uh, process could actually end up in a lower yield. But now with enzymes, because enzymes are specific, if we know the breaking point, then we know what enzymes are suitable and that enzyme will specifically lies only that particular bond. So that depends on what kind of unsaturated fatty acid we want and we can tailor that based on different types of lipases. So few, but the problem with this is that um, few applications. Sometimes with chemical modifications, it has happened a long time ago. So the process has already been optimized, the applications are clear. Right now, well, the, the research on lipases is huge. So ongoing research is showing great potential. Previously, the application was limited to the formation of polyunsaturated fatty acids. But, but right now, um, more applications for bioprocessing, not necessarily food, yeah, for bioprocessing in general, are being applied. So lipolit now let's look at where to get these enzymes from. Now, the uh, fatty acids are very specific. Because of that, we also need specific lipases, right? Enzyme substrate are very specific. So where do we get all these uh, lipases from. Now let's look at an example. La, the uh, lipases, lipolytic enzymes from Atlantic cod. Now they have very strong uh, fatty acid specificity, completely opposite to that of commercially available lipases. So they are different. So if we get these lipases from Atlantic cod, Atlantic cod is a type of fish, uh, also a deep, feed, deep uh, sea fish. They prefer to hide to hydrolyze uh, PUFAs over short chain fatty acids which is good because if you have a short long chain of fatty acids, then you can actually hydrolyze producing PUFAs. So higher concentration of omega-3 PUFAs are produced. Now then another example is from cod roll. This enzyme can also highly enrich polyunsaturated uh, the omega-3 fatty acids. Now we can extract all this from the pancreatic uh, organs of uh, all these fishes. But that will be relatively expensive too, because you still have to catch the fish, ex uh, harvest the pancreas, extract the enzymes. But with cell culture technology right now, with mammalian cell culture technology, we can actually culture pancreatic cells. We can actually modify the conditions to actually um, enhance the ability of the pancreatic cells to produce whatever enzymes that we want. In this particular instance, lipases. Now previously, uh, this course was shared between me and another lecturer in Inform. So she was, uh, she is the expert in mammalian cell culture, I am not. So, but this semester, she's in Germany right now, so she cannot take over this, this lecture. So, you unfortunately will not have the exposure to mammalian cell culture technology. I will cover microbial cell 
and plant tissue culture, plant cells. So she will culture, she was supposed to teach on mammalian cells. So you will not have the exposure of mammalian cells. But what I want you to get the impression of is that all cells, well, live almost the same way. All cells meet the optimized conditions. And when I tell you about optimized conditions, it will be back in, for example, lecture one, when we talk about all the conditions that is favorable for microbial growth. So those are also the conditions that are favorable for cell growth. So we will be talking about nutrients. We'll be talking about temperature. We'll be talking about fermentation duration. And then we'll be talking about, um, yes, oxidation, whether are there are uh, any um, micronutrients, things like that, okay? And of course, water activity, uh, osmotic pressure, things like that. So all cell lines, all cells, microbial cell, mammalian cell, or plant cells are the same. So when later I cover about plant tissue culture, then you will see plant cells also need all these conditions. It's just that when we talk about nutrients, the nutrients are different, obviously, for plants compared to microorganisms. And the nutrients for mammalian cell and the nutrients for microorganism will also be different. But in general, they still need nutrients. They still need the conditions to grow. So same thing here. In this instance, if we have a pancreatic cell culture, we can actually work on it to optimize the production of certain lipases, okay, for the production of polyunsaturated fatty acids in concentrated forms. Okay, the next one will be the skinning. And uh, I don't know if you cook, but those of you who cook, uh, maybe you eat the whole fish? Well, not entirely the whole fish, but you will eat the skin, right? Yes. That is because the fishes that we eat, the skin is edible. Have you thought about fishes where the skin is not edible? Cannot think of any. Hard to think. Uh, with uh, scales. Oh, that's very common. Just descale it. All right? Okay, never mind. I'll give you a surprise later. Okay, now, I'm very sure most of you who have eaten um, very conventional Western food, uh, for example, fish and chips, right? Where the whole fish fillet has no skin. Or sometimes, sometimes they have, sometimes. But I find those in a more expensive restaurants. The cheaper restaurants, uh, I don't know, <laughs> no, no skin somehow, right? And then it's uh, baited, so they deep fry that thing. And if you just cut it open, you won't see skin. So that's the uh, skinless fillet. So manually, that can be done. I'm going to show you a, a video, very easily done, to the skin uh, fish. So that's the easy part and you can see the whole piece of skin is uh, collected all right that's because it, uh, that was caught fish so that's an easy fish to the skin now previously it will be very laborious now that was that video was used to sell that equipment as you can see there's a certain model there so that's the de-skinning model so of course they have to show that it's easy otherwise no one's gonna buy it now look at this what they call Raja Radiata uh, Raja radiata is a rayfish, a type of rayfish with very, very tawny skin. Uh, it's hard, you don't want to eat it, and to de-skin it is also a challenge. If this were to be put into that model just now, that de-skinning model, <laughs> I think maybe a few rounds and you need to change the blades already, all right? So this is the type of a very hard to de-skin fish. But that doesn't mean that this kind of fish cannot be consumed. I personally like rayfish a lot. I don't know if the rayfish that I consume is this species. I doubt it. Otherwise, it would be very expensive. I think many of us would like rayfish too, right? Cook in curry. Um, very easy to debone. You know, when you're eating, you don't have to worry, worry too much about the bones because the bones are relatively soft anyway, and it's just one, one small, smooth piece of bone. Um, what is the Malay word for rayfish? Pari, ikan pari. I think we have it a lot in Desa, right? They sell it. I, I, I personally love it. Anyway. But this is of a, a different species. Now because of that, Raja radiata 
is less consumed. So they are what we call underutilized. Because no, no, some of them, they are, ca they are caught. When people see that, they are thrown tro back into the sea. It's not that they cannot be eaten, they can. But the processing for that is laborious. Uh, labor intensive, time consuming, and not to mention that if you were to use all this de-skinning machine, it's going to kill many of this de-skinning machine. So this species is very underutilized. 2,000 tons of skate, well the other name for it, Raja Radiata, is skate. They are 2,000 tons caught annually. Because when they catch fish, you don't know what you're ca catching in your net. So they will catch, collect whatever they want, and when they see Raja Radiata, throw it back to the sea. So annually, that's how much uh, they are caught. Caught but not utilized, so underutilized. Okay? So manual de-skinning, now this process uh, can be very laborious unless we have one of the um, machines just now that works very efficiently for Raja Radiata, but as far as I know, there's none as of yet. So if we really want Raja Radiata, yes, you still can, but you will have to manually de-skin it. Now, one, two things. One is a tawny skin, and secondly, the skin adhere very tightly to the flesh. So if you were to peel it off, it's not as easy as peeling codfish. Just scrap it off. When you peel it off, some part of the meat of the, uh, of the flesh will be attached to the skin, so you end up losing yield because some of your flesh are gone together with the skin. So enzymatic de-skinning. So enzymes can also be added into the solution, of course, with your uh, chopped meat products, chopped meat fish flesh product with the skin together, with the addition of enzymes. Now let's see what kind of enzymes. Now this enzyme will partially denature two things. One is the uh, proteinases one, where we also use collagenase again, and the other one is the carbohydrases where it actually denatures some of the carbohydrates that actually uh, keep the skin and also the flesh stuck together. So partial denaturation, now we see immersion in an enzyme solution at low temperature because we still do not want to denature the enzymes. The dissolved skin then could be rinsed off. Now bear in mind, this is the ideal situation. If the skin is completely dissolved by all the collagenase and carbohydrates. But if it cannot be completely dissolved, not a problem still. With all this enzymic treatment, it can be still scrapped off rather easily. Relatively easy, easier compared to before enzymatic treatment. So it actually aids in the processing of the skinning. In many instances, not exactly um, the skin in the sense that the whole skin disappears. Okay? But that can happen, but I think that would be very expensive because you will need a higher enzyme concentration, higher or an enzyme lower concentration but higher activity and most probably a longer time. So let's look at the uh, enzyme solution, like I've mentioned just now, the proteases, the carbohydrates. Now the carbohydrates, what do they do? They actually loosen the collagenous layer. So skin have a lot of collagen, they loosen the collagenous layer. So once that is uh, loosen up, proteases can come to attack. So they work in synergism. Now, the, uh, the skinning of tuna, uh, preheating with steam, 60 degrees C, usually lower than that because we don't want to denature the proteins or the enzymes, followed by digestion of the skin with a complex uh, mixture of uh, uh, enzymes and also at negative at around 50 degrees C. Then the skinning of herring too. It can use cod pepsin. Now pepsin is a stomach enzyme, okay? So this is a stomach enzyme from cod. In Norway, squid is also de skin and tenderized using enzymes. Papain, in this case, papain. Uh, this one. Okay, now this is just to give you a brief outline. You don't have to memorize this. I don't expect you to memorize this. When we talk about the usage of enzymes, people think, oh, easy. Just extract the enzymes and we can use it. Yes, we can. That's what we call crude enzymes. But most of the time, uh, industrial applications, we don't want to deal with crude enzymes because the enzyme activity is very hard to control. One batch of crude enzyme compared to the other batch of crude enzyme, are you sure that the enzyme activity will be similar? It won't, definitely won't. So most of the time, we would be using um, pure enzymes or near to pure enzymes where we know exactly how much enzyme activity it is. If we know how much enzyme activity that the, that the enzyme has, we know how much concentration to add in for every batch, so it's consistent. 
For the food bioprocess students, not to worry. Next time I'll be teaching food uh, downstream processing where we'll be talking about all these processes. For food students, I think you will also go through uh, some of this. Uh, I don't know, enzyme purification. I, I believe you would, you would study that in uh, enzyme tech. You will, definitely you will, because I learned that myself last time, so definitely you will have to. You'll be learning about enzyme kinetics. You'll be learning about um, uh, enzyme activity, how to convert that activity to international units, how to convert that into uh, uh, enzyme rate reaction, things like that. So you, you will be, you will be doing that. Now basically what happened is this. Now let's look at um, how easy or how complicated this is to get enzymes. Now you have minced fish or minced maybe fish stomach. Let's say we want to get pepsin, okay? Then go through homogenization, centrifugation and all that. And the supernatant, we will get enzymes. But that is crude enzyme, all right? Then we have sorting out. Now enzymes can be precipitated. Enzymes are proteins. From the crude enzyme solution to get, well not purified yet, we just want to sort it out, precipitate it, just to get the protein fraction. So when we get the protein fraction, we are not sure whether, yes, what, what they really are, are they really enzymes? No, whatever proteinaceous compounds all, 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 all precipitated together. So, but at least, at least we separate out all the other compounds already. Okay, we know it, we are getting proteins. Then after that, centrifugation again and all that, then supernatant precipitate, uh, uh, centrifugation get the supernatant again. Then we will have to go through all these columns. We will have to go through some sort of um, chromatography separation. I will talk about chromatography separation next time. So basically, based on chromatography separation, uh, we will get individual compounds. So we know, okay, maybe at two minutes, I get this compound. At six minutes, I get this compound. Oh, the enzyme that I want is coming out at six minutes, for example. So six minutes, collect that fraction. And after that, uh, it will go through further purification. Now, depending on what kind of uh, process that we are looking at, so end purification can sometimes be like crystallization, uh, things like that, where we actually get certain crystals of uh, the purified compound. It depends on how pure we want. The purer it is, the more expensive it is. Why? Because you have to go through more processes. Okay? So that's how it is when we get enzymes. So this is a purified collagenase example. Now, this is the example of using collagenase to the skin. Add the uh, samples, fish samples inside, add the collagenase inside at optimized conditions, optimized concentration, optimized enzyme running conditions. Okay, then we would get the, uh, the skin foul fish in this example. Now, then we also have the skinning of squid. You know squid sotong, right? Uh, the squid that we well that I buy from Tesco, I don't need to de-skin much. It's already pretty smooth. But there will be also other squid, larger ones especially, with hardened skin. Now may, many of us may not know that when we talk about the skinning of squid, we're not just talking about the outer skin layer. Inside the squid, there is another layer. Uh, not the mucus, it's also the skin, collagenous layer. So how, how do we actually de-skin the outside and inside? Outside we can de-skin, we can manually de-skin, right? You can peel it off or we can use a de-skinning machine. But inside, how to do it? If you were to chop off your squid and the de-skin the inside, you know inside the squid there's, there's a lot of uh, um, gut content, which is, uh, well for me personally, is the most delicious part. So I don't know about you. You, but right, when you cut off your, your squid, you know inside you have a lot of intestinal content. So usually we cook that together. So that's the inside part. Uh, if you cut that off and to de-skin the inside part, then obviously you have to remove whatever intestinal, I internal contents already, no fun already eating squid. And now that's the squid body. Then we have the squid's head with the tentacles and all that. That is normally the hardest part, the, uh, the most uh, sp spongy, rubbery part, right? So that is where if we want to eat that, we don't want it to be so spongy, so rubbery, that's the part where the skin has to be the skin, right? So all these also serve a purpose. We are not just de-skinning fishes, we can also de-skin squid. So in this example, now the muscles and tentacles of the squid uh, and also the interior layer are the most complicated to be de-skinned. 
So manually, the skinning outside is okay, like I've said, but inside will be very uh, labor intensive. Okay, but we can, uh, of course, if we use enzyme, uh, machines, the machines cannot deskin the inner parts. It can deskin the outer part. Now enzymes, we can use enzymes because enzymes selectively attack certain substrates. Enzyme substrates are specific. So if we have the right enzyme, and we, if we were to immerse the whole squid sample into the enzyme solution, the enzyme will target specifically whatever it wants to target. So if it's a collagenase, it will target collagen. The collagen can be outside, the collagen can be inside. As long as the enzyme has access to the substrate, it will react, oh, of course, under optimum conditions. So it, uh, for enzymes, it attacks and removes whatever it wants specifically, and it retains the other tissues. So we, we will not have the problem of uh, oh, chemical uh, removal, changes the texture of the squid, and you won't be biting squid, you'll be biting a piece of rubber. So we won't we would have less likely that kind of occurring problems. Now, we have commercial proteases too. For example, trypsin, fysin, pepin, uh, but they may not actually degrade the native collagen of these uh, natural resources, such as this natural seafood. Commercial glucosidases and collagenases, they are expensive and sometimes to specifically act on squid, for example, it is also rare. So from nature, we learned that there are certain enzymes in the uh, squid intestines that could actually degrade back the squid's skin. So same like salmon um, ikura, remember? They're, we're using collagenase too, to actually separate the eggs, the ikura, from the skins. And we learned that from nature because the female fish actually releases collagenase to, de to separate the eggs prior to fertilization, right? So from here, from nature again, we can also learn that from the squid intestines itself, there are certain enzymes, proteases, that can actually act on uh, removing of these unwanted compounds like skins and so on. So it can be used for de-skinning and tenderization simultaneously. So it actually uh, improves taste and texture, especially for the tentacles. Now again, if we were to get these enzymes from the squid, which means we have to keep killing the squid just to extract the enzymes. But again, cell culture technology now has made that also possible. We can actually uh, breed cell lines to actually produce that, that kind of enzymes. And once we know the enzymes, if the enzymes can be synthesized uh, successfully, commercially, and at a cheaper rate, why not? Just like transglutaminase. Previously, transglutaminase, uh, not previously, even now actually, transglutaminase is produced in mass production by micro microorganisms. Uh, I, 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 can, I cannot think of uh, the, the name of the company right now that I got my samples from. I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's Ajinomoto. They produce a lot of transglutaminase because of the production of monosodium glutamate. So instead of buying, why don't they produce themselves? And they produce through fermentation. So as you can see, sometimes fermentation can be a very cheap, not cheap, cheaper alternative to enzymes production, okay? So same like those squid just now. We know it comes from squid intestine. We can have squid intestine cell lines to produce that enzyme. But in comparison, microbial fermentation, cell culture, cell, I mean, mammalian cell line cultivation, of course, my, microorganism is cheaper. Uh, I'll start from uh, species identification, all right? So for, for, uh, for most of us, if we were to buy smoked salmon, you can see from all the major hypermarkets, uh, Japanese stores, smoked salmon, it will be vacuum packed, right? Tightly vacuum packed. And you can see that the flesh is orangey in color. So easy, just recognize, oh, orangey in color, that must be salmon, I'll take it. But in many instances, if you don't look carefully, that may not be salmon. That may be another type of fish. So for species identification, if you are not careful, you'll be picking out the wrong ones. Now, that is if we are careless, okay? Now, how about instances where they are deliberate, um, I, I don't want to say that they are cheating, but maybe uh, uh, some of the uh, sellers are trying to mis 
not, not trying to misguide, but they produce the product in almost similar look, in an almost similar look as smoked salmon. And customers or consumers sometimes get uh, confused, get, uh, mis uh, get all this misinterpretation, and um, interpretation and end up getting the wrong product. So uh, I don't want to say that they are tricking the consumers, but many products are like that, all right? Uh, but yeah, I'll tell you the story later, what, what happened. Remind me, yeah, once we go into a discussion. Anyway, okay. So now let's look at the last, uh, last sentence. A slice of smoke, a different smoke fish, all right? Trout can look very same as salmon. Let's see if I have the photo there. Okay, now this is species. In terms of uh, fresh fish, what we know, well, I won't know too if I look like that, but it, I look at it at a glance. I'm not the type who will go fishing, but if I were to be the type who goes fishing, catch a lot of fish, or eat a lot of fresh fish, then I would know. Now, this is a trout. Obviously, a trout will look very different to salmon, right? And this is the brown trout. Trout basically have all these spots on its body. And then the salmon is longer, whiter at, at the bottom. But even between this and this, it can look almost similar. All right, but that is in a in a in a fresh fish, live fish forms. Now, if we look at oh, now we looked at the uh, the ones that are sold. Now this is a smoked trout. This is smoked salmon. This is smoked bream. All three are very different fishes. Now, I'm comparing them side by side. You can see the difference. If you don't have a comparison, and you just go to a hypermarket and see orangey vacuum pack, and you just grab one, I can easily take this, take, take this as a salmon, or take these. These look pretty much like a salmon to me. So for, for this kind, well, if they're labeled nicely, it's OK. They're not mistreating the consumer or misguiding the consumer. But what about if um, they are companies that are deliberately trying to misguide the consumer and giving consumer the wrong product? So of course, every time we import something, import export business, we have to check. Seafood business is huge, but the regulations are also very stringent. They have all their um, pathogen testing, uh, no, no, no different, different pathogens and things like that, toxicity. But how about, uh, how sure would the uh, industries be if whatever that they are importing are the right type of fish? So how do we detect that? Well, there is actually a way to detect that. Now, prior to all this enzymatic method, the AOAC actually have their own method too. We use HPLC, which is a liquid chromatography, like I've said. So they will separate out uh, different types of uh, protein, electrophoresis and things like that, and then evaluate the proteins. See whether is that protein specific to that specific type of fish species. So the proteins for trout, bream, and salmon are different, okay? Um, based on that, AOAC have developed that method. But these are very laborious, they're very time consuming, and most of the time, Time is a very important factor because you have all these frozen fish coming in, import business. You don't want to wait three days just to get an analysis or data, uh, analysis out or data because your fish will, will have to be kept at uh, storage, frozen storage for three days and you cannot distribute to your, to your uh, downline suppliers. So we don't want that. So what happened is that they've come out with an, uh, an enzyme assay called ELISA. So ELISA, we, we keep calling it ELISA, but the long name for ELISA is actually enzyme link immunosorbent assay. It is rapid, it is fast, it is reliable, and it's specific. So I'm gonna talk about the principles later. So as you can see, that's the power of enzymes. Enzymes are not just used to uh, de-skin or to remove eggs, or basically for us, for food products. But this is also very much related to food industries, but not for us to eat directly but to be used as a tool for diagnostic. Okay, to diagnosis what is going on. Okay. Now, ELISA, basic, the basic principles of ELISA is this. It has one antigen and two antibodies. Now remember the enzyme substrate principles. Enzyme and substrate are specific, right? 
the lock and key principles. But now with neo theories coming out, the, the, there seems to be no uh, the lock and key uh, hypothesis do not hold that strongly anymore because now there are also new hypotheses coming up that it doesn't have to fit that nicely as in the lock and key. The enzymes or the substrate sometimes can modify and readjust to suit each other. So that is the second hypothesis, all right? But basically, whether it's lock and key or whether they can uh, alter, the, uh, alter a little bit to, to, to suit that kind of a linkages, the ba basic principles and understanding is the same. It is specific. The enzyme is specific for the substrate. So for the uh, ELISA um, principle, the antigen is also very specific to the antibody or vice versa, all right? The antigen won't be specific to different, different, different types of antibody, which is why, for example, if you want to go um, to get a jab for hepatitis, that is to fight against hepatitis antigen. So you get the hepatitis antibody. You, you won't be getting uh, uh, some other antibodies to fight hepatitis A, for example, right? So it will have one antigen and two antibodies. Now, why is that so? The first antibody will bind to the antigen, right? Then there will be a second antibody that binds to this complex, but at the same time, it can also bind to an enzyme. So all these three must be present. Later I'll show you a, a, a cartoon. It will be bind to an enzyme. Now, the enzyme is also very specific to a substrate, right? And if we add the right and correct substrate in, and the enzyme is there, there will be a color change because of the reaction. So based on this color change, we will measure the uh, intensity of the color. So basically, the higher the concentration, the higher the, uh, the, in the color intensity. So if the color is not changing, obviously there's no reaction, okay? So we, based on, that, that is why ELISA is very fast. Just detect the color change, read the uh, color changes value, most of the time, absorbance, and then we can take a value we know already, how much concentration is there. Now, now let's look at the cartoon. Now this is what I mean by one antigen and two antibody. Now this is what we call primary antibody, secondary antibody. Now the primary antibody will, will, will get a link bound to an antigen, and this is specific. This primary antibody won't bind to just any antigen. It has to be a specific antigen, just like enzyme substrate theory, okay, concept. Now, as you can see from the cartoon here, this is the primary antibody, and it will bind to antigen. Now, if there is no antigen, will there be binding? No this antigen, particular antigen. No, they will not. So it's a specific antigen. Okay, bind. Then binding to this complex is a secondary antibody. Now, this is the structure of a secondary antibody. So this secondary antibody will actually bind to this whole complex. And again, if the antigen is not bound to the primary antibody, if it's not bound, means it looks like this. The secondary antibody cannot bind to because there's no binding site, all right? So the antigen binds to here. This complex, the secondary antibody binds to this. Now, the secondary antibody has an enzyme. It's attached to an enzyme. Now, this enzyme is also very specific uh, to, to a substrate. So we know what the enzyme is. We would know what substrate to add in. Now, we will add in the, the correct substrate that reacts with this enzyme and the reaction will go on. And once the reaction goes on, there will be a color change. So we will take for reading. How thick is the color? What intensity is the color? We get an absorbance reading and we know. Now, if there is no binding whatsoever, this will, it's a chain reaction, basically. The antigen does not bind, the secondary antibody will not bind to the complex. Although the secondary antibody has uh, an enzyme, but because it's not binding, to the antigen and primary antibody complex, there will also be no reaction. So they, once we add in the uh, substrate for the enzyme, there will also not be a reaction, okay? Now, for this, um, for this example of the salmon trout, uh, salmon, trout and beam, bream fishes, what are the antigens, what are the antibodies, and what are the enzymes? So the primary antibody basically, um, not basically, mostly they get it from rabbits. They get the antibody from rabbits. So of course, now they get it from rabbits. 
Uh, last time they get it from rabbits. Now you don't have to keep getting from rabbits anymore. There's also the cell line culture where you can actually extract the antibody. Okay? So all these are all linked. The enzymes, uh, the antibody, all can be extracted via bioprocessing. Okay? So the, uh, the primary antibody basically utilizes uh, an antibody from rabbit. And the antigen uh, here will be the protein. So the pro antigens are protein. So basically, what acts as the antigen in this reaction is the uh, protein from the different species of fish. So different species of fish will have different types of proteins. So basically, they act in a manner of antigen, very specific to that antibody. Okay? So we know right now what fish we want. If we want salmon, what protein does salmon have? We know. Uh, it acts as a marker already. So we know what, what um, uh, protein it is, so we can actually know what antibody binds to it, uh, which is why I can say that uh, one of the most common, commonly used primary antibody comes from rabbit, because it binds to this protein for salmon. Okay? Then the secondary antibody uh, will be the anti-rabbit immunoglobulins, that is a secondary antibody, and it will bind to an enzyme. And the enzyme is horse, uh, horseradish peroxidase. So this horseradish peroxidase is the enzyme. I hope you know all the ASE, ASE, ASE at the back, that's the uh, term for enzymes. Okay? Now this enzyme will ultimately need to bind to a substrate, right? And the substrate is uh, the tetramethylbenzidine. Okay? That's the substrate. So if we add all this in, reaction will occur. I want to show you a video. Hopefully you will understand the concept of uh, ELISA. There are, oh, there are a few actually. Now let's look at this one first. Try to read the text as you go on. Now that's the primary um, this is too fast. Okay, I think I need to explain. This is way too fast. Okay, now when we deal with all this ELISA, most of the time we cannot see what's going on. We're just adding chemicals. In very in, in a plate maybe uh, slightly bigger than this, it has many, many wells. Most of the time, 96 wells. So one time we, we put into the reader, we can take 96 samples, reading all at one shot, which is why ELISA is very fast. And um, well, I have that in my lab. I don't know if we have time that I can show you. So we'll be just adding uh, chemicals. So basically, those are the wells, right? We need to coat the wells uh, with something. So we are coding it first with the primary antibody. So this is a primary antibody. Okay. Then we were adding in uh, antigen and so on. You see how things are washed wash out? Uh, sometimes we can add the sample in together. So whatever um, antigen, in this case will be the, uh, let's say, salmon uh, protein will bind to the an, uh, primary antibody, right? The one that are washed off are most probably other proteins that are not specific to the primary antibody. So it's washed off. So in ELISA, during ELISA, we have to add in uh, chemicals, then we have to let it incubate for a while, then we wash it off. So whatever that is bound will not be washed off. Those that are not bound will be washed off. So what are not bound? unspecific proteins, okay? So that those are washed off. Then you see you add another antibody. This is the secondary antibody that binds to the complex. Then after that, we will add in the uh, uh, substrates because the secondary antibody will already have an enzyme. So we add in the substrate. As you can see, the substrate is red in color. So if you have a lot of binding, there will be a lot of red color. If you have very little binding, then you have very little red color. So based on the color changes, we know what's the concentration of whatever proteins that we're trying to detect. Okay? So if we use this method and evaluate uh, using salmon proteins, one thing to, de to detect salmon. 
and we can see that there's no color change. Obviously, that's not salmon. Maybe some other uh, uh, fish or some other things. I think this would be a little bit better. The third one is to show you actual lab, what happens. Okay. Now this is, uh, I don't know yet which is which, but I, su I would suspect the one on the right would be the right one and this one is not the right one. So that's a primary antibody and when we add our sample in, we're adding a lot of things in. Okay. So we have all the green rods, we have all the round, circular, uh, uh, group looking thing. So let's see what happens during binding. Okay. So this is bound. These are the green rods that are not specific to the primary antibody will get washed off. The ones that are bound will remain bound. Then we add in the secondary antibody. Now as you can see, the secondary antibody is bound here. It won't bind here. Okay, because there's no antigen. Then you add in the uh, substrate for the enzyme and you can see color changes, okay? Now that is the cartoon. Now when you're, when you're really dealing with that, you won't see all this binding. You only see color changes at the end. Adjust the intensity of the scan up or down depending on the brightness of each outlet. 
Okay, so basically when we talked about adding primary antibody, uh, reacting that with antigen, we think that it's fast. It is not that fast. You see how they have to incubate, shake. Well, that depends on enzyme uh, uh, reaction. What type of reaction you're dealing with, what's the uh, incubation temperature and how long. Basically, but in, in general, that's how it is. We have to leave it for a certain time, certain temperature for, it to, for the uh, incubation and the reaction to happen. Then after that, we have to rinse it, right? And the, at the end of the uh, video, you will be seeing different spots of white color. But the spots of white color, if you notice, they are of different intensity. So that shows the different concentration of sample antigen or sample proteins that you're detecting. Okay, then we can also use enzymes to detect freshness of seafood. So we have talked about using the enzymes for basically food preparation. Then we talked about enzyme to diagnose different species. Then we also now can use enzymes to actually look at uh, how fresh your seafood is. Now most of us will think that oh, the this, this seafood sample is no longer fresh because we smell certain odor, right? Or we look at the uh, texture of the seafood, it is no longer firm, maybe already watery, already soft, sometimes already slimy. Now that can happen because of various reasons. Most of the time, it will be because of microbial growth. Because for fresh seafood, once dissected or once killed, there will be a lot of microorganisms from the gut going to the flesh. And that could also, uh, because seafood is a very rich source of proteins. So it can be a, a rich breeding ground for microorganisms. That's one thing. And the other thing is that all the intestinal enzymes will be released. So that will also act to uh, change the texture of seafood. But most of the time, when we talk about odor, we will be looking at uh, hypoxanthine. Uh, we will be looking at, um, wait, there's another example here. Tetramethylamine. Now these are all the compounds that actually contribute to the odor that we are uh, censoring, okay? So uh, TMA, TMA is even worse. It's uh, broken, da broken down to dimethylamine, monomethylamine, and so on. So that will contribute to uh, an increased order of uh, not so fresh seafood products. Now, we can actually detect TMA with enzymes uh, using an enzymatic method. Now what happens, e uh, okay, let's see. We can actually start off with a little bit of a history. Last time, what happens is that to detect TMA, it would use a very laborious method. But now, uh, with enzymatic method, we can actually have a TMA dehydrogenase. So what happens is that we know the substrate. We want to detect TMA. If we can get an enzyme that reacts with TMA specifically, and of course, once a reaction happens, it will produce another compound, right? And if we can detect that compound, then we can have a detection of the entire reaction already. If there is no TMA, even if we add in TMA dehydrogenase, there will be no reaction. And there will not be a production of compounds, for example, PMS or PMSH2. But if PMSH2 is present, it has to come from TMA, right? And it comes from TMA upon reaction with TMA dehydrogenase. So now, with enzyme activity, we managed to detect PMSH2 and all those uh, incubation at what temperature, for how long. Same as what we have watched in the video just now. There will be a change in color intensity. So if the color intensity is high, it would mean that the TMA concentration is high. If there is no changes in color, it would mean that TMA is not present. So based on these color changes, we know how fresh the fish is. Instead of just smelling it and detecting the odor with our nose, now we know very quantitatively how much concentration is TMA. So if TMA is, for example, 100 ppm, and that is already considered very not safe to eat, then we have to throw the samples, okay? Okay, substitute or rennet. Now this is uh, relatively simple. I want you to read on your own because I want to enter into discussion already. Now, substitute or rennet basically is like this. Remember the uh, video that we watched on production of cheese, right? We have to curd uh, milk 
to form cheese, so we added rennet. And again, this is a lesson from nature. What happened is that during digestion of milk, uh, the stomach produces rennet, it curds uh, milk, which is why it goes through the digestion uh, uh, late, later on. So from that, we get an idea, okay, we can use rennet to actually produce uh, milk, uh, pr produce cheese from milk, curdling of milk. But what we do not know is that uh, most of the rennet are actually obtained from young cows, the calves. So um, I think from my slide you can see it's from the fourth stomach. Uh, they are herbivores, so they are four stomachs. So this rennet is from the fourth stomach. And it's from younger animals. So there will be a lot of um, ethical issues because you're killing all the young ones, young, young calves. And there will also be a lot of economical issues because instead of now breeding the cow to mature age where you can sell the meat uh, at, at a higher cost for consumption, now you are slaughtering the uh, young calf just for rennet. And what happened to the young calf? It won't be able to grow anymore for milk production and so on. So th there are a lot of uh, economical issues, a lot of ethical issues. But due to a lot of um, my, uh, bioprocess intervention, we can actually have a lot of enzymes that can replace rennet from microorganism sources, from mammalian cell culture sources. So this enzyme can work pretty well in curdling milk, in coagulating milk to produce cheeses too. But of course, there are also other controversies because sensory panelists are complaining, saying that the cheese that are produced from non-rennet sources, maybe microbial enzyme sources, do not taste that good. So there will be a give and take, yeah, sensory evaluations and the actual product and uh, trying to replace rennet. So I want you to read this on your own, easily understandable, okay? So I'm going to stop um, on this enzyme part right now and I want to enter into a discussion, okay? So think of, uh, oh yeah, I want to, I want to comment on your uh, Q&A. Uh, try not to ask me questions that you can easily Google. Try ask questions that are more challenging. Don't, don't ask me what is Renet. Uh, you can Google that.